I think we can now start the first session, and I would invite to the podium our first two speakers. Please. Today, with some practical demonstrations of different manifestations of UGC, I'm sure that many in this room, like myself, have heard about mashup and remix, but I haven't got a bloody clue of what it means in reality. <laughs> we have also heard about appropriation art. I would like to know more about it. So that's the occasion so that we have a little bit more knowledge about the practical side so that later on our legal analysis is, is a little bit more geared to reality. So it's, it's a great pleasure to give the floor first to you, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel has a, a, an interesting CV. He's a producer, he's a songwriter, an artist manager, a professor, and PhD candidate at the law school. But more importantly- well, Actually at Western in music, actually. In music. But you are doing your master's or PhD in law. In musicology, actually. In musicology. OK. Even better. <laughs> this <laughs> we need. He's also a DJ. And I would ask the DJ to give us a great demonstration of remix and mashup. <laughs> Please entertain us. I'll do my best. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk today because um, in my experience as a DJ and electronic dance music uh, creator, um, I run into issues with user-generated content uh, a lot. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm going to talk about user-generated content practices in yeah. contemporary electronic dance music in the community. I'm going to show you an example of a mashup that I made and all the originality that went into creating that mashup. And I'm also gonna take you through uh, what happened when I posted that mashup online on a site called SoundCloud, and what happened with respect to uh, them actually taking it down. So a little bit of a background about myself. I'm a PhD student in musicology, and I focus on record production and the creative practice um, of that uh, production. I teach in the music faculty at Western. I teach uh, popular music studies and I also see, uh, teach music production. But my main um, endeavor these days is I'm a DJ, and this is a picture of me uh, DJing. Uh, my DJ name is Lance Romance, and I'm a resident DJ at a Toronto's now number one club, the Hoxton. So I'm a member of the EDM community, I'm an avid blog reader, and I've opened for many big DJs, and uh, find myself in the Canadian EDM community, um, a big and active member. So today I'm going to talk about some common user-generated content uh, practices in electronic dance music. So there's three main types of UGC practices in EDM. There are bootleg remixes, and bootleg remixes are non-commissioned remixes. So remixes that are not uh, commissioned by the original artist. There's also DJ mixes, which is organizing um, a bunch of tracks or recordings into succession in a creative manner. And um, you can upload that as a coherent whole up on sites such as SoundCloud, MixCloud, et cetera. And the one we're going to get into a lot today is mashups. And that's taking parts from uh, two or more uh, tracks and organizing them into a coherent whole. So a little bit about bootleg remixing. It's a huge source of content in modern electronic dance music. And often, people illegally download um, acapellas, which are vocal parts, or stems from sites such as Mr. Acapella. Um, whether the legality of this is, um, whether this is illegal or not, to me, um, it, it isn't. Um, but the content is available online. So people will download these mashups, and they create their own sounds and their own backing tracks to uh, these acapellas. So I have uh, an example up here of, I think it's Party Rock Anthem. So I'll just play a little bit of this song. So that's actually a remix, a bootleg remix of the original song.
So what that person did is they downloaded an acapella and put their own parts and created a new uh, piece of work and put it online. So a lot of creative originality going in there. Um, DJ mixes, another really original creative practice that happens in electronic dance music. And I have uh, some software up there that people use for making DJ mixes. And the basic gist of it is you look up at the top left is there's two tracks. There's one track on the left side and one track on the right side. And what you're doing is organizing these tracks um, into succession. And this is very creative because a lot of things go in, such as what key, um, what songs mix together with one another. And you're, you're getting a new experience of the track within this mix. The creativity is immense, and often they're put up uh, for download online. So today I'm going to really go in to mashups. And again, it's very common UGC uh, creative practice in electronic dance music. Um, and it's when two or more tracks are combined together creatively into a coherent whole. In my experience as a DJ, mashups are a key component of my set because it, it plays with the audience's expectations. And it provides them a brand new experience with using uh, works that are copyrighted. So I'm gonna show you right now the creativity that goes in to making a mashup. Okay, here we are. So, this is a program, just like a painter has his canvas, uh, producers have their canvas, and this is my canvas, this is Logic Pro 9. This is the canvas I use to paint um, my compositions. So, I'm gonna take the microphone over here. So, what I have is, down here I have the original tracks. So I have a song called Toxic Rush. I have a song called Oh My God. And then I have a song that you probably all know, uh, Superstition by Stevie Wonder. And I have two versions of the acapella. I have the original acapella up here, and I've actually time-stretched it to fit the beats per minute that I'm working at, which is 128. So if you see the different colors I've given to this track, all of the purple parts, right here, here, and here, are, are pieces of the track that I use in my final mashup. And with this track, this red part, is the, the piece that I used in my final mashup. So I'm gonna take you through just exactly what is happening here, because this may seem a little bit new to you. Um, so, I'll play the first song, which is called Oh My God, and I'll play you just a bit of the introduction. So the way electronic dance music tracks uh, often work is there's an introduction, and that either goes into a breakdown or a drop, and the drop is sort of like the chorus of an electronic dance music song. So what I really liked was the introduction of Oh My God, but I wasn't a big fan of the drop section. So I'll play you the original song, and then I'll go and I'll play you the drop from the other song that I used. So we're in the introduction right now, and when you see it get to the yellow part, we're gonna be in the drop. So that's the original drop that you hear. And I'll play the next song, I'll play Toxic Rush, I'll play just a little bit so you can get a little bit of a feeling. I don't have enough time to play the entire song. But I'm gonna play the uh, introduction as well and the breakdown, and this is gonna go into the drop that I actually use in my mashup. And you can see when it gets to the red part, we're gonna be in the drop section. So this is the drop that I'm using. So when you put those together, it kind of sounds like this. We have the introduction from the song that you heard before, and we're gonna go into the drop of the other song. You can see that right up here. So right there, I've played with the listener's expectations. Uh, they're expecting something else, and I've given them something that they didn't expect. What's, what's really cool is the third component that I use in my mashup, which is from Stevie Wonder. Um, I'm gonna just play you the breakdown, just so you could hear uh, how different this actually sounds from uh, the original. So I'll, I'll, why don't I play a little bit of the acapella? This is just fun, really fun to hear 
uh, I think. So this is the original speed. And you can, you can hear the headphone bleed in the background. And I've sped it up. Okay. So why don't I play what that sounds like over the breakdown of Toxic Rush. And I use some effects, and I'm going to explain the effects that I use uh, when we get to this part, but just hear it first. And we're going to go back into a drop from Oh My God, the original song that I used for the introduction. You can see that in the purple over here. So right now you can imagine the crowd absolutely going nuts, um, which is what actually happens. Uh, this mashup, I play it all the time. It's, it's you know, it always in my, my back pocket. And it's, it's great because I made it myself um, and I'm really proud when I play it and I just love the reaction because everyone knows the Superstition acapella and I'm really playing with their expectations because I've taken that breakdown and I've gone back into the drop from another song. So why don't I, I and, and a really cool thing that I, think that is a little funky that I did was I took some parts from the end of the acapella. Stevie kind of goes off and does these little, he, he has these like, uh, he kind of says, uh, or I think over here he goes, uh, just kind of taking a little bit of, you know, snippets here and there. And what I do is I actually blend those over the first drop. So if you see these uh, little green and blue things, those are just kind of cut up little parts. So I'll play those. You can kind of hear them in context. So just, just adding a little bit. And then every eight bars, I'll, I'll add a little bit of an extra vocal here. And I have a little bit of another line over here. So I'm taking little snippets from the original vocal, creatively cutting them up and placing them at strategic points that I think is just going to make this a little bit of unique. Um, other than that, I'm going to take you now into a little bit of, this may kind of seem uh, a little new to some of you who are unfamiliar with record production, but the main point is just the creative originality that I'm exhibiting in making this mix fit together. So if you notice over here from the drop section, I've highlighted the channel uh, and the volume is at zero. But the second I go down to where I have the breakdown, I've actually lowered the volume and I've put what's called equalization onto the original track. And what this does is it takes some of the top end out, which leaves more room for Stevie Wonder's vocal to fit on top of that. Um, I may, I'll do an extreme EQing here so you can see. So if I took all of that EQ out, but I'm just taking a little bit. Uh, and taking a little bit out at three and a half kilohertz, which is a range where the vocals always cut through in the mix. So what do I do to the Superstition Acapella to make it fit? Well, you kind of see that there's all these blue things over here, which are called plugins. So I'll play you the original vocal with no plugins at all, and I'll just start piling things on so you see what kind of a difference it makes. So you can hear that headphone bleed. So I put something called a noise gate on, and watch what happens to the headphones. It 
goes away. So what that does is it takes all these parts under a certain threshold and removes them. So getting those things out of the way, out of the mix, to make this fit. I then put a compressor on, which um, is kind of like an automatic volume knob. What really it does is it brings the vocal out a little more. So I'll play you the... Just comes out right in your face, you know? Then I put some equalization on to take the low end out and boost a little bit in this vocal presence range because I really want his vocals to cut through the mix. Just listen how much it brightens it up. Just really kind of bringing it forward, getting rid of that low end because that low end is going to be a real problem in the mix. And uh, we need this to uh, play on, on club speakers and sound great. I then add some reverb and delay, which adds some kind of sparkle sauce. Why don't I put the delay on, actually? So you can hear the delay. And then what I'm doing here is if you see these little lines that are going on, I cut up his vocal, and I, I have this the way, the way, the way part. And I start pitching it up to create intensity before that next drop. And then um, I take the outro from Oh My God. So I just wanted to go in and show you all um, sort of the creative originality that goes into making a mashup, because I think it's really important um, for you to understand that it's not just slapping two songs together. There's a lot of creative originality that I exhibit in using these effects processing plugins and making things fit in the mix, and also just choosing what parts from each song. And also, a lot of the reason why I chose these songs is because they're all in the same key of E-flat minor. Another thing that goes into consideration when making a mashup. So you all have uh, this on your uh, sheet of paper. So in Canada, I strongly believe my mashup would fall under fair dealing. Um, it's done solely for non-commercial purposes. Uh, when I post online, I do mention the original creator. Um, I believe the existing work or other subject matter uh, was not infringing copyright. And it's very hard to prove that I'm going to affect the potential um, exploitation of this work. If anything, maybe this will in increase the uh, sales of superstition. So I post my mashup on a site called SoundCloud. And this is a quote from their copyright page. I know, it's pretty incredible. Um, simple as that. Don't use content created by anyone else. But a huge part of being an EDM artist is making mashups, is making bootleg remixes creating DJ mixes, using other people's content creatively um, in, in your original way. And this kind of makes me a little bit angry. So they took my mashup down when I posted it. And this is the email that they sent me. And it's really important to, to note the terminology that they use fair use and not fair dealing. So and it, what makes it even more confusing, uh, fair use is not a concept that is recognized in all countries respect copyright on a worldwide basis, and then they tell you to go search around the world for um, information on copyright in your own country. So I believe, my, personally, that what I was doing under section 29.21 was absolutely fair dealing. I was absolutely allowed to do this, but SoundCloud doesn't think so. And to me, it seems like they're following fair use in the USA. And point number three, really drives it home. I've used a substantial part of pretty much all of the works. So as, as artists, this is a little bit confusing to me because um, in Canada, of what my knowledge of the law, um, as an EDM artist, uh, I believe that I am totally in my rights to create this user-generated content. But SoundCloud doesn't think so. So where do we go from here? Well, we're at a really excellent point in Canadian copyright legislation. 29.21 was a huge step in allowing use for copyrighted content. It's really good to be an EDM artist in Canada. 
the USA is really less conducive to EDM creative practice. However, platforms really have to adapt to the changing laws around the world. And maybe somebody can maybe make a Canadian version of SoundCloud because as of now, what I'm doing in Canada is absolutely legal. Um, and I'm under my user's rights in order to make this user-generated content. So if you'd like to stay in touch with me, I have a Facebook page, I have a SoundCloud page, and uh, I have a UWO email. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you for your time. You made also your point at the end uh, with great eloquence. I'm sure that during the discussion period, uh, we have a few experts here, and I'm looking at uh, Madame D'Agostino, who has written a couple of uh, excellent articles on fair dealing. She may perhaps cater to your needs. As fair use doesn't apply in Canada, it's fair dealing, and it may very well be that what you do may come under the realm of fair dealing. Anyway, I was going to ask you, do, do you accept students? Pardon? Do you dispense any courses in mashup? And uh, hopefully next year, actually. I'm, I'm proposing a course on uh, pro uh, contemporary EDM production. I'm sure that the IP section in Osgood would gain a lot in having Danielle teach a few Teaching courses. Teaching everyone to make remixes and new technology. Yeah, and I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. Enlarge the horizons of the students. <laughs> Do you officiate in a discotheque in I, Toronto? Pardon? Do you work in a discotheque? Yeah, I, I work, I, I'm a resident DJ at the Hoxton, which is at King and Bathurst. And actually, BlogTO just rated that as Toronto's it's in, number one it's club. It's in Toronto? Yeah, if, if you guys want to come. Well, maybe we may go and pay you a visit this weekend. I mean, people are usually in very colorful clothing, neon clothing with sunglasses, um, usually Everyone neon as well. Is <laughs> Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. Thank you very much. And now I pass the, the floor to Gordon, who will be intervening in the domain of visual arts. Uh, Gordon is himself an artist, but also he's militating for uh, the defense of artists' rights. He has founded, in particular, the Appropriation Art Coalition in response, and I am reading, to the threat of more restrictive copyright legislation in Canada. He lives in Vancouver, thus perhaps his nice tan on his face. Gordon, you have the floor. Um, this is going to be a pretty rapid fire thing. I'm going to go kind of over the history of appropriation, history of user content, um, what appropriation is, how it works, how it relates to the law, and show you 30 examples of w video works in 20 minutes. So with that delay, I'm going to get started. Um, this is a quote by John Oswald. It's kind of a segue between music and art. John Oswald won the Governor General's Award largely for a body of work called um, uh, plunder phonics, and uh, he was forced to destroy every copy of it by the Korea through uh, some heavy-handed legal activity. Um, but I'm going to start by just sort of telling you what is appropriation art. And I think the easiest way is to break it into two parts. First of all, what is appropriation? And secondly, what is art? <laughs> um, so what is appropriation? Appropriation um, is, has got many names. Um, Historically, it's been bricolage, ready-made montage, collage. Um, then it became combines, interventions. Um, move, moving on, it became recombinant, simulacra, deconstruction, transformative, remix, recycles, uh, scratch, mashup. Um, some people call it plagiarism, derivative, theft, piracy. Um, more, more recently, it's been known as semiotic. Um, democracy and 
user-generated content. Um, so when we're talking about user-generated content, everyone seems to think this is a very new idea, the idea of basing work on, on pre-existing material. Um, so I'm going to use the idea of the, the three graces, um, and we'll run through a, a very quick history of, of the work based on other work. Here's, here's a piece of the three graces from a house of De Dant Dantatus in Pompeii. Um, and I'm just not going to really, here is another work from 200 AD, 1469, 1482, 1505, 1571, 1580, 1638, Rubens in 1639, 17th century, 1737. You can see that these are all actually based on pre-existing works. They're essentially taking the form and, and remaking it in their own way. So this idea of, of doing work that's based on existing work we're up to 1850 now, 1888, late 19th century, up to 1912, 1990, 2006. And so you can see that this is not a new idea. This is something that's been around. What's new about user-generated content is that it's controversial all of a sudden, um, that it's even become illegal. Um, so what, when we talk about appropriation in art, we kind of go back to when the world was flat um, and everything was, truth and beauty were kind of objective and absolute entities, that they were fixed and, and attached to things. Um, when the world kind of became round and Einstein came along, everything turned into sub things that were subjective and relative. Uh, and these are things that copyright doesn't address well at all. Um, and as it moved into the arts, it was, it was kind of the kind of contemporary idea of appropriation art was kind of spearheaded by Deschamps, Joyce, and Cage. Um, Joyce even said he wanted to go down in history as a cut and paste man. Um, and interestingly enough, his estate has been one of the most ruthless prosecutors of people using his work. Um, and in the fine arts, um, Picasso, Deschamps and Brock at the turn of the 20th century began to use, to use what, what is more commonly known as contemporary appropriation. Um, so this is a piece by Deschamps, and it kind of illustrates the idea of how much change is enough. Um, you know, his, his drawing a mustache on the Mona Lisa and signing it um, was enough to change the history of art. So you could argue that, that this idea of, of the amount of work you can use or the amount of change you have to do being a, qua a physical quantitative thing is, is a rather kind of absurd notion. As we went through the 20th century, uh, contemporary art was really heavily influenced by a lot of thinkers, Lacan, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, Guattari, Saussure. None of this kind of thinking makes its way into law really at all. Um, ideas of modernity, uh, structuralism, semiotics, post-structuralism, deconstruction, post-modernity, and feminism all really heavily influence contemporary art. Um, and it's through these ideas that the, the contemporary appropriation artist works. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the second half of that, which is the art side. Um, the way art works, I mean, when we, when we think about art and we think about what makes substantial or significant art, um, we, we have to kind of understand how the art world itself works. Um, and basically, here's my next slide here. Uh, it, it's, the art world is essentially the biggest peer review system in the world. And it's made up of artists, public galleries, critics, educators, collectors, um, grants, sales, media, exhibitions, collections, donations, publications, reviews, papers, awards, celebrity shock, scandal, um, auction sales, commissions. Um, what else do we have coming up here? Come on, where's my next slide? Private sector, public sector, and all these things feed together. And when we look at all these things, all these things feeding together, all these information systems feeding together, looking at artwork, deciding what art is important, what's interesting, what's technically good, what's controversial, 
certain people start to rise to the top. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at this in the contemporary world, three of the top five artists using the criteria of sales, collections, articles, books, are appropriation artists. Um, Damien Hirst, his estimated worth is between 355 and a billion dollars. His highest price in auction for a single piece is $77.9 million. He uh, sold $198 million in one exhibition. Um, art Review have put him in the Art Power Top 100 in two th through two th from 2000 to 2011. Um, he has a studio staff of 120, and he's won the Turner Prize. He also, interestingly enough, one statistic I forgot to put on here is the, the artist resale fee that Carfac are fighting for. Damien Hirst collects approximately 40% of all of those fees in the UK for resale of his work. Richard Prince has an estimated worth of $30 million. He's had 89 solo exhibitions. 89 books and catalogs have been published about him. 82 articles. The highest price for a photograph ever was his $6.8 million for, oh, sorry, for a nurse painting, which was an appropriation piece. He had the most expensive photograph ever, $2.5 million for the re-photographing of a uh, tobacco ad advertisement for Untitled Cowboy. He's been on the Art Review 100 from 2005 to 2009. Um, here's what the law has to say about him. Recently, Richard Prince was sued by a photographer for, for using his work. Uh, the first ruling ruled that all of the work in the series had to be destroyed. It came to, I think, $20 million in works in the Tate, the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art. Um, virtually every major gallery in the world had a piece of this that they were ordered to destroy. The case has recently been overturned, thank God. But um, on to the third person. Um, he's, Jeff Koons has had 76 solo exhibitions, 361 group, 24 monographs. He's been featured in 236 books and over 700 periodicals. His estimated worth is 500 million. The highest price for a single work is 200, or 23.6 million. He's the most expensive living artist. Six of his works have been sold between 11 and $25 million each. He's been on the Art Review Power 100, and he has a studio staff of 150 making his work. So, so these are, first of all, they kind of break down the idea that appropriation art isn't serious. And second of all, the romantic idea of the artist in a room by himself doing this stuff is a bit out of date as well, with these guys having upwards of 100 people working on their, on their things. Um, Coons is also one of the more famous people who've lo lost a, an appropriation lawsuit. Um, so what you have is on one side you have the, the art world, this massive peer review system saying this is significant important work. On the other hand you have the legal system saying this is piracy and, and needs to be destroyed. So th there's a, a fairly big issue in terms of the art world. Here's the Jeff Coons piece that he lost um, for making a statue from a postcard, which is virtually what we saw with the Three Graces repeatedly. Now, when you see it, when you see it, it's always presented like this, that they're equal size, equal shape, um, when they're in fact, if you scale the two things, it's like, so Coons has made the three-dimensional, added color, turned it into a different media. Um, it it's only looks the same from one specific angle. Um, Richard, the P Richard Prince part of the w series that was destroyed is always presented again like this, um, whereas the painting is significantly bigger than the, the book page that it was taken from. And the Damien Hirst sculptures are always shown like this. He did an anatomical sculpture, which is in fact almost 40 feet high, bronze piece. So what I'm gonna do now is just leave that um, and I'm going to show you some examples of, of, I think everyone's familiar with a mashup where they think they are. So what I'm going to do is rapid fire run through about 30 works of video art that uses appropriation. So it'll be somewhere between 10 and 35 seconds of each one to stay within the time. So it, it's going to move pretty quickly and it won't give you a real sense of the work, but it hopefully will show you the different strategies that appropriation artists are using in the creation of their work. There's several of the works that I produce with my partner Sarah Joyce in here as well. 
because um, it's probably better if I talk about my theories than other people's. So we'll, first of all, we'll look at the idea of, of what artists do. One technique they use is to mash or to mix things up. Um, so the first piece I'll show you is Christian Markley's The Clock. The Clock is a, a piece that's actually a mashup that lasts for 24 hours. It's made entirely of film clips that show clocks. It runs in real time. You can set your watch to it if you go into the gallery. So every time you see a clock in the piece, it's showing the actual time of day in the gallery that it's shown, and it runs for 24 hours in a continuous cycle. Um, so this, this section I'm showing happens between kind of around 19 minutes after two. So every clock you see in every clip will be approximately 19 to 20 minutes after two. And so he strings it together into a, a, a long narrative. The quality of the real thing is much better than this. <laughs> so this, over the 24-hour period, it, it creates a kind of narrative story. Um, I'm going to keep moving because I've got a lot to get through. <laughs> the next one is also a Christian mark. It's called Video Quartet. It's made of 700 clips of people playing music. It's a four-screen projection, and it's 40 feet by 8 feet high, 40 feet wide by 8 feet high. Um, interestingly enough, he was actually arguably the first scratch DJ, Christian Markley. The first one to actually scratch records, apparently. Um, next I'll show you Slice, Slice Classics by Jade Spice Anderson. Here he's, he's taken the mashup and he's actually sliced all of the films of Alfred Hitchcock into strips rather than running them linear, linearly after each other. And that would have been a single screen large projection. Another single screen projection is Seeing Concatenated by Omer Fast. So that, that's a, a more traditional kind of five minutes left. Oh, man. I'm going to get moving. Um, I'll go into the hack. Um, what the ha hacking video would be where you actually modify the equipment playing it and disrupt the signal. So here's, here's a piece by Rebecca, Rebecca Barron and Douglas Goodwin where they've actually taken um, John Wayne film. The, the, uh, sorry, the name slips my mind. And they've d disrupted the uh, signal. Um, here's the self-playing bowling game by Corey Archangel. It's a 14-screen piece where he's gone in and hacked 14 bowling games by Nintendo so that they play automatically and only throw gutter balls. Um, so he's taken the idea of gaming and taken all the competition out of it. Um, there's the idea of deconstructing, um, where you actually take the film and you, you look at what makes film. Here, Les Levesque has taken Gone with the Wind, and he runs a, a red frame, then a green frame, then a blue frame, and forces the, the color to be created in a, a fairly mechanical way. Um, 
when, when is now is by Patrick Grizzard. And when they compress film, they, they make it play faster by, by keeping some pixels the same and changing others. So what he's done is he's created a two screen projection where the left hand screen is all the pixels that stay the same in compression and the right hand screen is all the ones that change. Um, sorry, these are really fast, but um, there's the idea of reenacting where, where someone will actually reenact uh, a, a scene from a film. This is by Candice Breitz, it's called Becoming. It's a 14 screen video presentation. Um, the third memory, um, Pierre Huig got John Walkowitz, who did the original Dog Day Afternoon armed robbery, and had, they built a reproduction of the bank and had him reenact the bank robbery after he got out of jail. Um, and this is interspersed with scenes from the actual film. Um, there's the idea of retiming film, which is where you, you simply alter the time of the film. Um, this is a piece by Sarah and I. It's called Drift. We've taken all three versions of Mutiny on the Bounty, and we've retimed them so that all the major events occur at the exact same moment. Um, here's Christian kissing the, the native girl. Um, in the middle, you have the 1930s version. In the left, you have the 1960s. and the right, you have the 1980s. Um, 24 Hour Psycho by Douglas Gordon. He's taken 24 hour, or he's taken Psycho and stretched it out to 24 hours. Um, what this does is it takes away any tension or any anticipation or any anxiety from the film. And the whole thing just moves really, really slowly. Um, the, the, more recently, uh, an artist named Daniel Martinico took the remake by uh, the remake of, 20, of Psycho and turned it into 24 Seconds Psycho. We can show this whole piece, I think. Um, this is a piece called Mean, again, by Sarah and I. Uh, we've taken the film Clockwork Orange and we've counted the number of frames and divided it by the number of edits. I'm going to go a little over. Um, and it comes out to about 11 seconds per edit. So every single edit in the film is now 11 seconds, but the film length hasn't changed. So everything that Kubrick intended to have you glance over is now stretched out to 11 seconds and everything you're meant to linger on gets shortened. Um, there's the idea of working with nonlinear narratives. Um, this is a piece again by us. This is Slaughterhouse Five, um, and what we've done is we've we've broken the narrative into the places that the narrative happens rather than the time it happens. And clips come up randomly on the left in America, in the middle in outer space, and on the right in the war in in Europe, and they just come up randomly. So the viewer has to construct the narrative in a very different way. Um, Horror Chase by Jennifer and Kevin McCoy. They've rebuilt the set from L Night of the Living Dead, or no, sorry. Uh, 
I can't remember, sorry, they've lost the film for a second. Uh, they've recreated the set and a computer randomly plays the, the, their reshoot forward and backward, changing the speed endlessly so that it never repeats and it never ends. Um, there's the idea of intervening. Here we have uh, Gillian McDonald who created a kind of obsession with Billy, Billy Bob Thornton and inserted herself into several films with Billy Bob Thornton. Um, also taking a, a song that he sung and uh, turning it into a duet. Uh, linked by Pierre Bismuth, he's shown the film Sleuth on a TV screen and every time there's an edit in the film, the room changes that the TV is in. Uh, the idea of dubbing, where the audio track has changed. Um, this is Pierre Bismuth's Jungle Book. He got 19 different language versions of the Jungle Book and re-edited it so every animal speaks a different language. Mowgli speaks Spanish. Um, Baloo speaks um, Yiddish, I think, and Bagheera speaks Hebrew. Or um, this is the untitled fairy tale by Eileen Maxson. She's taken Cinderella and she's put a sound an audio track from a teen film over top of it. Uh, this is one of ours, Lawrence 5.1. We've taken the quarto two of Hamlet and had it read by an electronic voice, and then we've taken Olivier's Hamlet and resynced the entire film to match the voice. This work, when it's finished, will have over 30,000 edits in it. Um, people apply just special effects to things. Um, here, Les Levesque has, has taken vertigo and he's shown each frame right side up, upside down, left and right. So I'm really having to race here to get through this. Um, this is a more typical mirrored mashup. Um, I'll skip this one. Uh, I'll skip this one. Those, these two are pretty, pretty common, so I'll skip them. Um, there's the idea of collage, which is just layering and layering images on top of each other. Um, Chaos Hags, she's created several characters that get projected in various spots throughout a gallery. And this is just using several effects to create a, a sort of heavy visual overlay of film things. Uh, in this one, he's taken 65 consecutive nights of the monologues by Jay Leno um, and the other two talk night hosts and superimposed them on top of each other. Um, we're almost at the end. <laughs> Erasure. Um, here's the birds without the birds. The artist has digitally erased all of the birds from the horror film The Birds. Um, in this one, Martin Arnold has actually digitally removed dialogue and then digitally closed the mouths of the people speaking. There she would be speaking. And over the course of the film, whole characters get erased. So the dialogue slowly breaks up and then disappears. Um, this is another one of ours. We've taken the 3-4 ratio, which would normally be shown on TV, and blocked it out so you're only able to see the things in the margins. Um, I'm going to have to really race through this. Um, so 
the, there's huge differences between how artists see the law and how the law sees the law, I suppose. Um, so these are going to have to really go fast because I'm completely out of time now. Um, I would equate it to the difference between those who, between how artists see the law and how, how the law sees the law is almost like creationists versus evolutionists, where artists believe it's a license, um, the law believes it's a, many people believe it's a right. We believe in a thriving public domain. Works are built upon previous works, works are create, or works are created spontaneously out of nothing. They should have a limited duration, and some believe. So we sort of have these, these radically different ideologies that drive a, our, our, our work. Um, they also preference um, chronology above all else. So whoever did the thing first gets all the rights to it. So there's the old saying that a duck is a duck is a duck. Um, and so in that case, one of these, two of these are infringing on the other work. But one is actually a photo of a duck, one is a photo of a painting of a duck, and one is a photo of a duck lure. So they're completely different things. But I think some people would argue the two are infringing the third. Um, and just to finish off here, we'll clear up by saying virtually all appropriation is non-rivalrous. Um, there are two exceptions, erase de Kooning and if Hitler was a hippie. Um, these artists bought a suite of Adolf Hitler paintings and painted rainbows in them. Um, but virtually all appropriation art is non-rivalrous. Uh, the work is typically not based on the work that is appropriated. The value is not derived from the appropriated work. The originality is between the creator of their work, not between that work and another work. And the copyright protects forms of expression, not just simply forms. And quite often, artists are changing the expression, not the form. Um, and it, bottom line, it comes down to to be or not to be. Um, you either have and the Charter of Rights Section 2 says everyone has the following freedoms, and Section B is freedom of thought, belief, and expression. Um, so I'm just going to finish off quickly with a piece that I did. When Bill C-11 was Bill C-22, um, I did a piece called Catch-32, which is based on Catch-22. And I'll just finish off with this. Oh, did I skip it? So that's it. More discussion? Well, thank you very, very much, Gordon. Uh, with you, it was an ear opener. And Gordon, it has been an eye opener. Uh, I think both of your uh, presentations were extremely instructive. I liked a lot your conclusion to the effect that all appropriation is not frivolous, and all that came with it. I think you, you very well uh, emphasized the, the one of the main problems uh, that artists and musicians may be facing today, that is perhaps copyright law is not always uh, evolving enough to take into account their current ways of creativity. Uh, now, um, 
I think, David, at the beginning, you, you mentioned this fair use, fair dealing thing. We have how long? Five, ten minutes still for discussion? Yeah? Perhaps one of you would like to uh, cater to this issue, not ask questions, but deal with it, uh, respond to David or clarify things. Perhaps the situation is not as dramatic as you might think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, could you please state your name when you take the floor? And yeah. That applies to everyone. My name is David Baskin. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm a host on Jazz FM 91, um, Canada's premier jazz station. And until 10 days ago, I was the CEO of CMRA, Canada's largest music licensing agency. I retired. Uh, <laughs> fascinating stuff, very thought provoking. Um, we could have a lengthy discussion on so many of the things that were put on the uh, on the air, things that I would agree with, such as I think The Clock is a brilliant production, some things I would disagree with. Um, uh, but the point I want to talk about uh, is Mr. Rosen's presentation, and um, specifically his assertion that his belief is that his work is within the exception provided in the Copyright Act, and I presume he's talking about the, the UGC provision. Um, do you get paid for DJing? Yes. Yes. Yes, you do. You use that DJ or that mashup, uh, which had Stevie Wonder in it, and it's a, it's very exciting. And you got it in your back pocket, and you pull it out, gets the crowd lit up. It's part of your act, and that's cool. Would you say that that is a commercial use of the work? Well, commercially available is defined in the Canadian Copyright Act um, as the this, it has to be available on the market for a, a uh, period of it time. It says the use of the work for non-commercial purposes, not dissemination. Dissemination is certainly included, but 29.21a does say, it talks about the exemption being applicable if the use is for non-commercial purposes. I would suggest your use of that very clever mashup is for commercial purposes, your work as a DJ. So that's point one. Point two, where was the acknowledgement of the sources? When I posted online, I acknowledged the sources. Your use in order to qualify for the exemption, in my view, would have to include an acknowledgement of the sources with each use. Even if you never posted it anywhere, if you played it during an EDM event, you've used it. You've publicly performed it. Would you suggest that SOCAN shouldn't be paid for it? Should SOCAN not be paid the performing rights for the use of the music when you perform it because it's a UGC? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to put you on trial or, or, or ask Something you for definitive answers. I'm illustrating some of the shortcomings of this dreadful piece of legislation. Point three, toss up, purely subjective. And the fourth point, whether or not it would have a substantial adverse effect, well, half a million dollars of litigation might give you the answer to that question. But I would suggest to you, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, that if Stevie, uh, Stevie Wonder and the other authors of the underlying works hadn't written and created those works, you wouldn't have them to use. And it strikes me that there is a fairly well-established commercial environment in which those provisions, which those, those components can be licensed, in which music publishers and record companies license those underlying provisions all the time. I know, I ran a company for 24 years that did that. So it, it, it's troubling to me that you're a very creative guy, you've got a hell of a command of logic, and uh, you know far more about producing a crowd-pleasing uh, mashup than I ever would, and I think it's great work. Um, but on the other hand, the suggestion that it should be a free ride for you because of this legislation that doesn't constitute a, a non-commercial use strikes me as a, a, a difficult proposition to expect and frankly, insulting to the creators. Um, well, the first thing is, is commercial, uh, commercially available is defined in the Copyright Act as being on the market and being available for a certain period of time and being, being able to, uh, to get a license as well. So the, the definition of commercial in the Canadian Copyright Act is also not very specific. So we can, we can have a, quite a discussion on what commercial actually entails, um, but the bottom line is that it's not defined concretely. So under my rights, under my beliefs, um, I believe what I'm doing is absolutely non-commercial user-generated content. 
Okay, Professor okay. Caris Craig. Thank you. From Osgood. Um, thank you so much for two wonderful presentations. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I do agree with David on one thing, which is I think um, seeing your work perhaps illustrates for us some of the shortcomings of the exceptions that are currently in the Act, um, even after amendment. Um, which is to say, I really think having heard your presentations that the focus should be on transformativeness as a basis for claiming fair use rather than arguing over exactly what is commercial or non-commercial or exactly what is parody or satire or criticism and review. Anyway, I don't want to take um, this panel's time talking about interpretations of the law. I think your time might be better spent reflecting on your understanding of your creative processes, your artistic expression. And so what I wanted to tap into is what I hear to be a slight difference in the way that you're coming at your artistic process, which is to say, I heard Daniel talking a lot about you often said, my creative originality, this is evidence of my creative originality, and so it seems to me that even although what you're doing is using pre-existing works, you're kind of wedded to the notion of creative originality as a kind of virtue, something that should be appreciated, something that should be encouraged. My understanding of appropriation art, I don't know, Gordon, if you'd agree with me, has been much more a sense that it's challenging the very concepts of origination and creativity, or that it's challenging um, the idea of being able to claim ownership over the results of creative expression. Well, I think I, it's my understanding that it absolutely, first of all, I, it is original works we're creating. Um, my understanding in Canada is that we have the skill. The, the skill and judgment definition of a, a original work, which, mm -hmm. which means that it's based on my relationship, as I understand it, between what my process and the final creation, not m my work and someone else's work. Mm -hmm. that, that's my interpretation of skill and judgment. Okay. Um, so to say that we're not, we're not interested in original, we are interested in original, and we're creating original works. We're using material that's out there um, to do that, Partially, but but with the with appropriation that the work there's this idea that somehow the work is based on, for instance, the the drift piece that uses the mutiny on the bounty is based on the mutiny of the bounty. It's not based on that at all. That was the the absolute last decision that was made in that piece. We wanted a, a historic event that was turned into a book that was turned into several films so that we could look at the, the historical storytelling, get some sort of idea about history and consensus and truth and exaggeration and, and fiction. And, and so we looked at several films and we had a checkbox of criteria and Mutiny of the Bounty checked check, check more boxes than anything else. Um, and more, almost always, that's how appropriation artists work. They're, we're exploring issues of authorship, of history, of storytelling, of narrative. We, we develop a system for it, and we, I mean, 24-hour was psycho could have easily been 24-hour chainsaw massacre or 24-hour love story. It, 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 it's not the point; isn't that it's psycho? Um, and and part of the thing with art is 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 that that. It's really about the creative process, and this is largely what Duchamp spearheaded at the turn of the century, was the idea that, that the form is the form, and that the process that, that, and the theory around the piece is where the value is. Richard Prince's work sells for a million dollars. Quiroz's photographs sell for a couple of thousand. The idea that the value is it, maybe, and his books don't apparently sell at all, um, but the idea that the value of the Richard Prince work somehow lies in the Karen, pho Karen photographs is ludicrous. It, it lies in the large body of work and research and, and work done around Richard Prince. That's where the value in the work lies. It doesn't matter what the source material is. The reason we choose source material more or less to give people a gateway into the theory. It, it's almost incidental in the choice of, in, in, the, in the work. I mean, this idea that it's based on the piece that's appropriated, it, it just seems wrong-headed to me then in the idea that it's our commitment to the idea of originality as something that emanates from the self, as some, the creative individual I think, I that think runs counter to the entire 20th practice. century in sociology, philosophy, psychology, all these sciences, we, we know that truth and beauty and, th and meaning can't be contained within the object. They have to be within the viewer. So the meaning of a piece 
can't, you know, the idea, all an artist can have is a kind of intention that this is what I'd like people to read from the work. You can't control what anyone reads from it. Um, so, so to try and protect the meaning that I encode into a work is, is pretty absurd. It's kind of like the scene in, in, the, in the Life of Brian film where someone, a man wants the right to get pregnant even though he can't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. They want to defend the right to be pregnant. The right to be pregnant, it's like I want the right to control meaning even though you can never control meaning. So it's this strange right that people have been granted that, that just simply can never, never be fully realized. Thank you. Uh, Professor Weber? Yes, I, I enjoyed very much that, uh, those pieces of art, although I must say some of it wasn't entirely to my taste, but that's another matter. Uh, I, I appreciated the, uh, the work and the thought that had gone into it. Uh, your comment about non rivalrous which uh, 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 Victor Naban picked up on as well, is a very interesting one because it, it, it suggests, uh, it taps into a theme of copyright law which has been lost uh, since the early 20th century. It wasn't always so. There was a period of copyright law where the only thing that was infringement was something that harmed the author's work, the copyright owner's work to be more precise. Um, and that uh, was rather an important point. It's one, it, it was one, it looked at, it looked at infringement as being the type of wrong like negligence. We're negligent all the time. You know, uh, I dare say everybody that went into this room probably tripped on one of our stairs. We do that deliberately just to teach you what taught can be. Uh, and we don't care that people are negligent as long as they don't harm others. Uh, and in a way, that's where copyright law has arguably uh, let artists down. It's formed a type of property notion around it. This is a property thing which you can be, which you trespass on. Uh, whether or not it's harmful, it doesn't matter. The wrong is committed simply by walking on the territory, even though you leave no footprint. But I think that uh, uh, we ought to be thinking about, uh, and I make arguments about this in some of my writings, notions of and I'm not trivializing your work by saying this, notions of triviality in terms of what constitutes harm. So that I would have thought that most of the work that you've done uh, is not trivial work, but it's work that trivially affects the work that you have used uh, to uh, create what you've done. And so when you come to look at it in that sort of way, you come and you ask yourself, well, where's the harm where is the, that has been caused to the initial, to the initial creator? Now, my friend David Baskin would say the harm is he could have got money for it. Well, uh, I, I dare say, but that goes back to the issue of treating this whole area, area as a fenced off piece of property rather than something like negligence, where so long as no harm is concerned, continue being as negligent as you like. If you want to hurt yourself, good on you, but as long as you don't hurt somebody else. But the hurt then has to be quite tangible, non-trivial, and quantifiable. Thank you all for your contribution. Can I address that? Can last. I address that? <laughs> yeah. yeah please, I mean, shortly, it, if you yeah. can. Yeah. It, I, just in one of my talks, I actually show a slide of, of workman's compensation damages for loss, loss of a finger, loss of an eye, loss of an ear. And I, I measure that in the number of, of songs pirated. So the loss of an eye is equivalent to the same loss monetarily as seven songs downloaded. Or uh, I, I haven't got the statistics with me, but the, it, the, the, the idea of loss is truly exaggerated. And, and if you talk about harm, you could argue that, that if SOCAN costs half a million dollars to run every year and iTunes downloads pay 14 cents to an artist, then that's probably seven to a dollar. So that's roughly 35 million downloads artist fees go to keeping SOCAN's door open before the artist gets anything. And I would argue that that could be seen as more harmful than the download, illegal downloads or the, or the sampling or anything I'll else. I'll send you something that I wrote, which I make something that's very interesting. We're on a very similar wavelength on one aspect of this. Uh, there was a, a case which went to uh, the English uh, Supreme Court, UK Supreme Court, a, a little while ago dealing with 
Star Wars and knockoffs of the Star Wars helmets by, well, knockoffs was actually the person who created them, who was doing the knocking off and was being sued by Lucas from in, in, in uh, the United States. They came to England and we'll probably touch on that uh, towards the, one, of those pro, uh, one of the last uh, uh, sessions. But the, uh, a default judgment was entered in the United States for around around $20 million for having, for the uh, English uh, seller having sold $15,000 gross of, of, of his helmets in California. Um, and eventually the, that ward was knocked down uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom. We went to enforce that in the United Kingdom and uh, uh, I won't go into the long story, but the short story was they didn't get 20 million. But I thought the interesting point about well, that was the perverted scale of values that we have here. Because of the same uh, year that that case was being argued in, in the United Kingdom, a paraplegic who'd been knocked down uh, and had uh, her life expectancy reduced to about 10 years, got around two and a half million pound in damages. And I thought it was an interesting contrast that we're, the, the way we think of this now, that, that life has been turned upside down in the sense of we value economic loss or economic harm or we create economic harm as a greater value than actual life. And, and it happened to, and, and, and apparently this seems to be perfectly normal in this new world. I think we should be going back a little bit uh, and thinking about that aspect. Yeah, the last speaker, uh, I, I guess you are Mr. Ovid MacDonald. I compared the picture and you look the same. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, two quick questions. Uh, did you push back on uh, SoundCloud? On the takedown notes? I did, and I, I gave them, uh, I, so that actually, that email was a response to an email I sent them saying, you know, as a Canadian citizen, and I've read your copyright pages, uh, they're actually quite confusing. Um, they really don't say what country they're following. So as a copyright user in Canada, uh, I sent them, you know, section 21.21, and my defense is under each point, and, and I, I really do believe this is not a commercial UGC, and they actually, I've done that twice, and they, they have this same email that they sent me, which was the one that I posted up there. They sent me the exact same email twice. But why do you think it's uh, SoundCloud's uh, requirement? Why do you think SoundCloud has to host your work? Like they're, they're a company and they have the right, like you, you, you're a user under their terms of service. Amit, please, does everyone hear him? So, so you should speak. Sorry, I was just saying that it, it seems, the notion that SoundCloud has to host your oh, work they, is they, a bit odd. Um, they, they don't have to, but SoundCloud is a community um, where the majority of EDM artists are sharing their original work and their mashups and their DJ mixes and posting them online. So they've created a community where a lot of people are employing user-generated content practices. And they have a, a copyright identification system, which I think, you know, at the beginning of every month, they throw a bunch of tracks in there and it, it, it'll detect uh, what it is. So this thing took mine down. So, um, no, they don't have to, to host my content, but they've created this community in which all these UGC practices are going on and um, sometimes they, they single out people like myself. And, and just to, uh, we, we could dig into that in this afternoon, sure. but uh, I just uh, asked the question to the gentleman who was talking on the publishing and licensing side, how much would it cost to could license you, Could that, you uh, speak to the mic? How much would it cost to license the, uh, the sample? For this, if uh, if Daniel it depends on the use. It absolutely depends. Well, for your use, uh, we have somebody here from licensing. Just how much would it cost to license that sample? I'm just curious. Yeah, I guess you would be tackling this topic this afternoon. Amit. In less than 30 seconds, yeah. three musical works, three sound recordings, six separate assets have been used. It's impossible to say off the top of your head what it would cost, but it costs nothing to ask. Okay. Last question. We are running a bit late, so please, could you identify yourself, please, and, and when you reach the mic, of course. Andrea Rush, a lawyer and a sometime musician. And as a lawyer, I, I, I think this could is Could you a, speak um, a as bit a, louder, as a, please? Andrea Rush. And oh, Andrea, yeah. Hi, hi Victor. <laughs> uh, as, as a copyright <laughs> lawyer, I just want to say this is a an amazing forum for dialogue um, and a great opportunity. And I think a lot about balance 
And as a sometime musician, I think a lot about creation. So it's, it's really great to be here. And, and the one thing I think about as, as a, a sometime musician is that creators create because they, they need to create. And, um, and of course, they need to be acknowledged and rewarded. And um, of, of course, as a lawyer, I think a lot about balance, and I appreciate that. Um, what I, I'm very um, interested in is hearing uh, the approach of the panelists um, to identifying um, the whole notion of derivative work and whether there isn't a point at which uh, the creation of a derivative work, even though it's transformative, does still require that recognition and reward of the underlying work, notwithstanding the creative process. And when I look at the non-commercial use, I'm wondering um, when that kicks in. Um, is it a question of timing? Is it a question of uh, uh, timing of creation, uh, timing of reward? Is it a spectrum? Because really the key is I don't think that these are incompatible notions. So if the panelists could give those of us who have to tell people what to do, maybe some bright lines, if not bright lines, maybe some guidelines as to what's the division between rewarding the underlying creator of the work in the context of a transformative derivative work and the application of the exception or user right or whatever you want to call it that, that you folks have been talking about. Thank you. I think that Thank you, Andrea. it has to do with commercial use here. Um, derivative works often, um, you know, Weird Al and people like that, they're using them commercially. And what I'm doing here, um, in my mind, under Section 29.21, is not for commercial purposes. I can't really go into where the, the line between derivative and that stops. But as a Canadian citizen, not knowledgeable in copyright, um, this is what I believe. Um, uh, well, first of all, the idea of derivative work is pretty alien to me. Uh, these are original works. They're not derivative works. They don't derive from the, 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 the film or whatever is being used. Th that idea that it somehow is derived from that, I would wholeheartedly argue that it isn't. It's an original work. Um, the, other, the other thing is, is that, that Typically, the appropriation artist isn't interested in, in sampling a, an individual's work. We deal with, with big, they tend to deal with big cultural things. They have to be things that are recognizable by a large population. They're not out to, they, it's, like I said, there's like the Hitler paintings and the Erase de Kooning are the only examples I know of, of artists appropriating and, and physically doing anything to other artists' work. And nobody's stepped forward to defend Hitler's moral rights as yet. Um, but but um, so the idea of, of you know, remuneration for, for someone who uses a film that's grossed half a billion dollars and they're making a, a piece of artwork, it, it, the remuneration that they would ask for would be out of reach of anyone. So it, it, we just have to make it and pray for the best. Um, and in terms of, of, of kind of acknowledging, crediting people, if you look at a film, and a, a film roughly 5% of the time film is on the screen is running credits. If you use like Christian Markley's 700 clips <laughs> and you have to run the credits from every single film, there's no room left for the, the work itself. I mean, there's a, there's a practical element. The film, they work with things that are so publicly well known that, that Crediting them is, is a moot point, almost. Everyone knows Lawrence of Arabia. Everyone knows Psycho. Everyone knows Hamlet, or more or less everyone. So they're, they're, they're credited in the media at large, if not. And usually they're le credited in the book catalog or the label anyway. But Thank you both, and thank you all. I mean, it has been going very well. And thank you particularly, Gordon, <coughs> for having traveled from Vancouver, especially for this occasion. I, I forgot to specify that. That is much appreciated. My pleasure. I think the session was, at the same time, very informative uh, and also very intellectually stimulating. <laughs> That's correct English. <laughs> and I think uh, we don't have a break.
So we have to move immediately to the second session. Uh, poor you. 